Uh, my name is Helen Hart. Uh, I'm with JTU, but actually I'm with APL, and that's where I consider myself to be. They're just associated um, in the space exploration sector. Uh, FIO, so the operations group. Uh, I, I wonder here a little bit. I'm here to talk about the New Horizons OPNAP switch. This is an operations oriented talk. Uh, having with some of the talks yesterday, the day before, today, uh, you've already done your work. work. You talked to the users. We've been flying this spacecraft for years. We've already tried to break it uh, and do something that wasn't in the original design spec. Uh, going to work with what we have, and this is a very specific solution to a very specific question in a specific environment. So I doubt it's applicable to any, any of you, except that uh, if you have people running your machine who can understand your documentation and have you to talk to, uh, you can do, do things. Uh, so uh, move on. Uh, I'll a little bit of time. Uh, mission and talking about optical navigation. I don't really know what, what I didn't know what experience, what well, actually knew about any of this stuff. And then I get into the off nav switch itself. Okay, mission. We'll start off with the spacecraft. Um, New Horizon to Pluto. Uh, this is the spacecraft. It's uh, been described as a, a as a grand piano with a sports bar sized satellite dish stay top. Uh, as five instruments, which I won't really ask. It's not very large. Uh, the dish is seven meters in diameter. No, sorry, seven feet. Uh, the two things I wanted to point out were the cameras because they have to do with optical navigation. We have two on board, the high resolution pan chromatic camera, the LORI, which is here on the minus X side of the spacecraft. And here is red imager, much lower resolution. It's on this um, my minus Z spacecraft but it points in the same direction as Lori. Uh, one of the features of this spacecraft is that the antenna is fixed to the spacecraft. It cannot be rotated. So we can do one of two things. We can either look at it and take a picture, or we can point the antenna to the Earth. You can do both as if the target and the Earth are exactly the right angle apart, roughly 90 degrees. That doesn't happen, especially when you're going to Pluto. Uh, uh, this is the time. Oh, wait. There we go. Same, different picture. I forgot to take the first slide. Oh, and go on here. Uh, KB by January 2019, not 2017. Thank goodness we'll never be ready for 2017. Uh, so we launched January 2006. Very launch. Made it past orbit in nine hours. Slightly more than a year, we did the assist and science mission at Pluto. Uh, in that 13 months, we did the post launch verification of the systems and the instruments, and we planned the Jupiter science sequence, and we did all of the stuff. We were very, very busy that first year, continued being busy. Um, 2007 to 2015 flyby. Uh, it only looks uh, actually we're we started seeing the flyby sequence, science sequence, summer after uh, we we uh, flew by. We began science team deciding what science they really wanted. 
wanted to do. This is what we had in the mission simulation before launch. Uh, uh, very busy up until Pluto flyby. And uh, one we did in here was uh, address that had been identified. So um, one of the is if we don't fly close enough to Pluto, this is the planned flyby trajectory. Uh, we're aiming for a closest approach to Pluto of about 1,500 kilometers off, off the surface. That's a little more than 1,400 off of the uh, 500 kilometers off of the uh, center of the planet, uh, 50 kilometers, and we wanted a time of transit within plus or minus 100 seconds. These are the requirements placed on navigation. And now, I want to fly through this point. This point needed to be adjusted and selected to maintain critical science of these occultations. We flew through. The sun shell and the earth shadow of Pluto, and we only got Charon, but we did get something, and that our attempt to detect an atmosphere is Charon. So, uh, vertical, very tight nav requirements for something that is a very long way away. Okay. Sources of uncertainty in this trajectory were the spacecraft position relative to Pluto. Pluto's position relative to the system very center. Uh, uh, Pluto and its moon Charon are, the uh, Charon is a uh, diameter. Uh, the uh, very center of the orbit system is well outside Pluto's surface. Uh, so everybody dancing around their center cord, but a little harder to hit. Okay, and to do this, we did very frequent radio and optical measurements to improve position knowledge. Made small uh, adjustments to the trajectory, direction, and speed, CCM. And uh, there was also, in the last years, 2013 and 2014, the science team uh, made a concerted effort to improve our of Pluto's orbit around the sun. Uh, just to give it edge. Okay, optical navigation. Um, this is deep and accomplished by means of optical images. And the different than the uh, in the radio navigation objective. Uh, we're going to use the position of the spacecraft relative to the target. Geometric navigation. Uh, which is done communication antennas on the spacecraft and the Earth, is uh, measures the position and velocity of the spacecraft relative to the Earth, to the antenna system. Uh, so this is fundamentally different. And the uh, image must include the 10 background stars. Uh, so you can make an astrometric measurement. Uh, an op-nav image, this was taken uh, about Six months, less than six months out uh, uh, by the instrument. Uh, this is with a, a spike off the side. Karen Nix is supposed to be here somewhere, but I couldn't tell you where. Everything else in this processed image is a background astrometric star. And, and uh, um, they get at least three bright ones in every field. The fields were carefully selected. On this one, uh, four second integration, and I can't remember if this is a, a one four by four bin. And this is just off of the the um, Pluto J two ATL EDU site. So out there, if you want it? You can grab it. Uh, how much can optical navigation do? 
This is an oath that I pulled out of a session that NAB gave to Mission Operations in uh, 2005, uh, shortly before launch. The big thing out of this is uh, the bot is uh, Doppler in range, basically radiometric navigation only. We have additional errors in the thousands of kilometers until we get very close. But even hours out, our positional errors are in the thousands of kilometers. Time of flight error is a few hundred seconds. Um, and these are the same scale, so I've marked the, the, um, the 10 bar here. 10 kilometers for the positions and 10 seconds for the time. Um, with optical navigation, the air are, are 100 to 10 kilometers. Uh, this just here, I believe, is because we have enough knowledge. If we have optical navigation, we have enough knowledge to do a trajectory correction maneuver in this time frame. And your uncertainty goes up as soon as you've done the maneuver until you've measured it, and then it comes back down. Uh, you, you, you improve your, your knowledge of where you are relative to your target enormously with optical navigation. So this is critical stuff. We need this. Um, and failure of the lower instrument was identified as a slight failure for optical navigation and a lot of science as well. But uh, uh, it's a low probability of event, uh, but it had a large consequence. Uh, the only available was to co-opt the Ralph and the imager. Uh, it is good of a camera. It has a uh, much lower resolution, and its sensitivity for faint objects is much lower, so you can't use it till you're in. We did a lot of in various projects to determine when and how to the MVIC op nav. Uh, the recommendation was to use both images when practical and develop a means to choose between them. And so we're directed to develop the OpNav switch. Now this looks like a linear flow from, oh, project did all of this stuff, and mission op got an instruction. Actually, uh, the, uh, the foreign node, the foreign IV and V, was to the mission uh, system engineer uh, at APL. And, uh, it looks very similar to the, some of the stuff in the first talk from this morning. We have the probabilities and discuss what to do about it and how to do it. But uh, he, he consulted Carl and Carl talked back to him and they figured out that yes, we could do this. And then we got direct to it after they asked us, how can we do this? So it looks here, it's actually a lot more convoluted. Just, uh, from this slide, I'd just like you to note that uh, the relative of Lori versus MVIC. The solid lines are the errors for Lori, the thick dash errors for MVIC. Uh, we stopped seeing MVIC images in the, about 10 days before closest approach for programmatic reasons, and we never did these. So just ignore this tail here, really, we would have tail right around here. But even if this uh, factor of larger than lorry errors, it's still much better than radiometric alone. So, have switch. Over to the meat. Uh, the goals for the switch were to protect the mission navigation requirements against problems with failures of the primary OpNav image and to avoid downlink that needed to devote to science. Uh, very downlink limited. We had downlink rates in the order of 1,000 to bits per second when we're in the vicinity of Pluto. Uh, and I take the larger part of any downlink track that they were devoted to. So we do 
be very careful how we pour our down downlink as the science team had to had to uh, project in a few places and okay we won't take this science we don't really need it uh, and we still had to do other extraordinary efforts to bring down all of the science that they left in uh, strategy to uh, acquire scheduled off nav with both the primary and backup images here and default state on board the spacecraft which would compress and downlink navs from the primary detector and then create them to switch compression and downlink to the backup of nav by a real time command. Now, um, this within available C and D8 software structures, within operation sequence command paradigm, and to work within the operations real time commanding paradigm. Uh, we have constraints due to round, long round trip flight time, uh, nine, nine hour round trip flight time. Uh, uh, and uh, command sequences had already been defined. Our ways of doing things were defined. And more importantly, you think there were if statements. There are no if statements in our C and DH, in particular in our timeline. Uh, so branch within a timeline, do things some other way. So quick review of what's inside the C and DH. This is just the null that mattered to me. There's a lot of C and DH. Uh, anything marked with this um, slanty hash pad pattern is uh, flash storage. I say that because you can't overwrite it, change it. So we have autonomy rule space in flash. We have storage variables, which are not maintained, but they have default states when they come up. So the fact that the default state after a CNDH reset is zero to define the project in our in our solution. And we have space for command macros generated by mission operations and some is in flash and uh, part is devoted to the op map switch, which repurposed to the op map switch. This is just a of an OB, an onboard block. Uh, an onboard block is, is a map defined by mission operations that is copied flash and maintained on a semi-permanent basis. All the rest of the command space is temporary, goes away when, when there's a CDH re reset. Okay, all the state recorder did not lend itself to a picture, at least not that I could. Um, raw science goes from the instrument to the solid state recorder. That science cannot be played back. It is not packed away that the CDH can extract it and, and uh, link it. Instead, it can compress and packetize before it can be played back. So there's the steps that we need to go through in order to prepare any observation for downlink, and that's compression. Also, um, these uh, science, all the spacecraft data are written through the SSR as individual data types. Um, and data tagged with the MET time of acquisition. Um, access data on the SSR for compression or playback by their MET time range or by, by a bookmark. And a bookmark. Uh, talk about a bookmark like a like it's a bucket, like you store data in it. No, we have a set of pointers that are put together, saying this data starts here, and here. That data type starts here and there, here, and they're all associated with a certain bookmark. And, uh, we use these features in the NDH uh, to put together uh, our, our fix. We use the book to capture the OpNav data, bookmark to mark out compression, and playback. Uh, we have special autonomy rules based on a storage variable. Uh, 
the infrastructure system development. Um, we had to create onboard blocks to handle compression and playback by bookmark, one for the primary and one for the backup op nav. Uh, we create mock economy rules. We had to specify which sort variable we wanted to use. Uh, we found one that other people weren't using, other processes. Uh, we made uh, caches to see that data cap and initiate compression. Uh, CAD is a canned activity sequence. It is uh, uh, all command of the spacecraft is done by canned activity sequence, which is a user-friendly subroutine that takes input parameters, creates, the, and then you run seek gen and creates a sequence of commands with correct parameters and correct relative timing. The good thing about this is that you can find in advance that the timing is right. For the ranges that are allowed, uh, it's soul script to set the storable and available for use. And of course, above with the hardware simulator. Uh, and then structure, we need to find the infrastructure on the spacecraft by loading the new OBB and MOPS economy rules to the spacecraft and come to be used. So we had we had uh, about a year to develop before we uploaded and put these things into Flash. Okay. Um, that was within the strength of the CNDH. Now these are, this is the, uh, the sequence and real time paradigm. Uh, basically, we have the colors aren't meaningful except to uh, differentiate between track, which is when we have station with the DSN, uh, specific, well, downlink and uplink, interspersed by science blocks when the antenna will not be pointed towards the earth. And so, in general, we will identify an op nav opportunity in a science block and collect both an MVIC op nav and op nav, usually created in time. And paradigm op navs are required to be downlinked uh, as soon as they're taken or they're not useful. So uh, they need to be immediately <coughs> to the uh, trajectory solutions that nav does. So at the following acquisition, SSF is devoted to that to claim that particular op nav. And we have, so we have a track. Then we have an science block without op nav, a track, science block with an op nav, a track where we play back an op nav, a science block, a track, science block with op nav, and so, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, on board, this is basically how things would work. Uh, MVIC is off, Laurie's to the right. They Function essentially the same way. Um, uh, the here means something. Uh, pink is the events that are happening in the time that I'm referring to in a generic way. Um, is specific cat commanding for the op nav collection. And in yellow resides on the CDH in the spacecraft. So it's an onboard block or an economy rule uh, on this page. Thing here is in the command sequence itself. So for Android, the first thing you do is flew to the target, set up the instrument. This is the path in one parameter, which is the op nav duration, which I've specified down here. How long uh, you open the bookmark to collect the data, all the types of data that you need. Acquire uh, now commanding is done by the science sequencer. So these things need to be interleaved. And after the slide is done, we the closes the bookmark and syncs the low speed data so that they're close off the plus you play back. And you continue on to what are you going to do next in the time timeline. Okay. Slide. Um, once you're ready to 
depressed. And about to slew off from pointing at Jupiter, Jupiter pointing at Pluto, the antenna at the Earth. You need depression. Um, um, and we have a path that manages this. It's called our Lorembic OPNAP Comp TV, which has uh, type or the OPNAP switch, compression duration, and the compression data volume. Uh, both of which are for time timing. Uh, the first thing this does is it, if OpNAP is set to use switch, it goes off here, clears the fire count, enables the mob autonomy rules. When the rules fire, they uh, check the table, and this is where our statement occurs. Autonomy rule check at the storage variable. And the storage variable is set to 1. We call the OBD that uh, presses the MBIC and plays back. If it's set to the default state, call the other OBD, which is set to uh, press glory. And uh, so let's see, here we go. Yeah. And these uh, MPIC, you close the MPIC bookmark, disable high speed channels, cue the compression in that bookmark, and cue the, the, the um, mark in the compression bookmark for downlink. And for compression, discompression, sync type, and everything is ready for playback. By the time you're done slewing the earth and the track is set up. All this timing has to be accomplished manually uh, and in section, but that's how we create all of our all of our command systems. So uh, to control which uh, with the storage variable set to zero, which is the default state, we acquire Bob Nav and on this playback we play back the data. And so long as the variable set to zero, we will play back. Uh, at any time in this track or this track, um, as soon as you set the storage variable to one, and you have not had a CNDH reset, um, uh, you will compress MVIC and play it back on the next track. So if on this track, we uplink the command storage variable, and we get it up there before the compression starts during the slew to this, this next track, then we will downlink the MPIC op nav. And we'll use this in real time. <coughs> OK, environments placed on switched op nav data sets that are beyond the normal. Um, they must not exceed specified thresholds for compressed data volume and compression duration. Um, they everything had to fit in in a plot that we were able to define in advance based on the biggest lorry compression. And it's too big to fit in that, they had to reduce it. Because we only have time uh, to, to do this compression. Um, after restricted, uh, you can't take AMVIC image and turn it into an op nav. It has to be a very specific one, ditto for lorry. Um, and uh, careful coordination, very careful coordination is required between the data acquisition request and the interleaved data capture request. And the timing is correct down to basically one second tolerances. Uh, so this is just a summary of um, uh, the Soju, brief science block, acquire, and then you acquire Lori. You switch when you do the compression to compress the one that you want. Load the state of the spacecraft if desired during link prior to an op back acquisition. You send a real time command to change the value of storage variable. And on following the collection, you'll get whatever op nav you needed. Uh, and again, to this on the ground, uh, they're on our site.
software simulator. Uh, it did work. We um, applied it to designate critical op navs during the final approach. Um, basically, everything, every op nav between May 8th and July 4th, uh, about 30 Vic op nav pairs in all were dealt with this. Uh, Lori never died. Lori never showed any signs of degradation. The op nav switch was at the op nav switch to use the back imager. But got all of those Lori images, so that part of it worked. So we didn't use the switch, but the capability was there, had been needed. Uh, so several other things that we did during uh, during that cruise phase was develop things that, that we never need, thank goodness. Uh, my rules are uh, things that I had to read to make sure I stated them correctly. When I wrote and, uh, my acknowledgement to uh, my uh, uh, my mom, my engineer, uh, my <coughs> testing. Uh, for, uh, I, I'm first author because I wrote this. And I had to explain it to everybody how it worked. Uh, Carl is the mind that put it together. He's the one with the deep experience. Um, and how and how the C and DH works. So, uh, so I give him. He developed it. All I did was draw the pictures, uh, and I used it right in the sequences I built. Okay. Uh, of course, the uh, the PI and the project scientist and project manager. Uh, everybody worked possible. And it, are there any questions? I'll let do that. Yep. Okay. About um, how anomalies intersected with this CONOP. For instance, um, <coughs> any of the images that you were collecting as you got closer considered critical data? Did you? Yeah. Um, consider to switch which had selected because the primary wasn't available because it had failed or the interface had failed. Uh, no, uh, there was no order autonomy to make that, that choice. Uh, it was deemed that the that the graph to make the decision of whether Lori was in bad had enough shape. Uh, so we, in, in that regard, there was no. There was no hard way to determine that Lori was not operating properly. The images considered critical. Like, was there a period of time where if you didn't get images for a full day, your resolution would have degraded and have impacted the mission, something like that? Our odd schedule was supposed to be designed so that we could roughly every other one and still our target goal or um, aim point. So we had to be an acquisition. Uh, and indeed, three days of op nav, one event on July 4th. Uh, but not, yeah, even, I observed that Nav and have been requesting what they would like. <laughs> so even losing more than what they said they could live without, uh, they could live without that. Uh, so honesty within our our large concept. Okay. Other other questions? Yes. So uh, first, um, engine included don't consider options nearly as much as we would. So thank you very much for bringing an operations talk to this conference. You were a little apologetic about it at the beginning, but thank you. Um, to, to, I'm curious the future applications for this technique, uh, especially if the extended mission is approved. 
Uh, been any thoughts about uh, the accuracy requirements and any modifications to how this might, might work uh, for a close flyby plant in four years? Uh, I will have accuracy requirements for the next object. The next object is considerably tinier than Pluto. It's about the size of Nick. Um, uh, and admission hasn't been approved for myself. This is this is legit. So when Pat left this statement. Um can't that MVIC could possibly contribute anything to OpNet for this particular target. Even Laura are gonna be hard pressed that things won't be very meaningful until a few weeks beforehand. With Pluto we were we had our first OpNav campaign. Ten months out, um, and we're getting used. To I know yes. Uh, yes. current target. I don't think Lori can detect yet. An upcoming target uh, uh, from over. It might suggest it, but I, if MVIC can't even detect the target until a day or two out, we cannot use the results because there's not enough turnaround time. Around nine hours at Pluto, it's going to be ten hours at Scabia, more. So it just get it down and analyze. We need we need the data down and analyze it before we can even uplink anything. Thank you. Okay. Other.